Welcome to this lecture, which is obviously about substance use disorders in adolescence. Today, in a place you have never seen before, obviously, it's completely different and new. No one has ever been here. We are going to learn about substance use disorders in adolescence. So adolescents, some of them, use substances. I can't imagine any of you ever used substances when you were an adolescent. However, just in case you did, it's all right. Adolescence using substances doesn't always predict anything particularly negative happening later in their lives. Let's start learning about the scientific research on adolescence and substance use. So, let me switch over to my view here so I can see what you see. Although you don't see my perspective, it's this audio and visual thing that is happening. Excuse me, my, uh, yes, there. Anyway, I like it centered. Substance use disorders in adolescence. So there are various kinds of drugs. Humans, as far back as any prehistorical record we can find, have attempted to alter their subjective experience by using substances. We find records in the archaeological evidence as far as 20,000 and sometimes farther, many more years ago, of humans using mushrooms, peyote, things like this to have a bit of a different experience. And alcohol seems to have been around for quite some time. So substance use disorders in the DSM-5 are a subset of uh, addressing a subset of experiences that humans have had for tens or hundreds of thousands of years, possibly millions. And when those experiences start to cause significant problems in a person's life, and you know which part of the life we're going to be talking about? That's right, the Leben and the Arbeiten. Right here, the Leben und Arbeiten. All right, or psychological distress. So to diagnose these things, as you can find in your textbooks, which I'm sure you've all read thoroughly, although you probably shouldn't read them thoroughly. You should probably watch these lectures, look at the slides, and focus on the parts of the textbook that are touched on by these lectures, which isn't always everything. You need 11, this is how the scientists have figured this out so far. They've come up with 11 symptoms that you need two or more for. Now this is a huge, broad range of ways you can be diagnosed with substance use disorders. There are 11 possibilities and you only need two of them. Well, there are quite a number of them. Now, looking at these 11 things, uh, let's do this here. Now, let's look at the subjectivity uh, in these criteria. It's not horrible, but of course it's there. Here, in larger amounts, or over a longer period than was intended. That's pretty good. Now, intended, you have to get that from the adolescent or child themselves. This is almost always adolescence. Children rarely use psychoactive substances, even alcohol. Um, persistent desire, how long does it have to persist? A week, a day, a couple of minutes, a year? Um, but these are standard criteria that people use to diagnose things like uh, substance use disorders in adults. This has been fairly tried and true, and individuals who come to help themselves will frequently give you this information on their own. They will say, I have tried to cut down, and it's been unsuccessful. So this, this is uh, one of the criteria. Or you can say that a great deal of time is spent in the activities necessary to get the substance, to use the sub substance, or recover. Uh, you probably don't know anybody like this, but if you did know somebody who spent a lot of time figuring out where they could get alcohol or marijuana and a lot of time recovering and having hangovers and things like this, well, they might be having some sort of a problem that should be addressed. Um, craving is one of the things that is there. Now, craving is another subjective thing, like how much should you want something before it's a craving. Uh, recurrent use resulting in a failure to fulfill major role obligations, this is the Arbeiten. So the substance is making it hard for you to do your Arbeiten. Now, continued use despite having persistent social or interpersonal problems, this is the Lieben. Oops, that's not what was intended. 
That's the Lieben. It's messing up with your relationships. Uh, it, and then it goes on. There are many other things. Now look at these criteria. They'll seem familiar if you've ever had a unit on substance use in another course, for instance. Uh, important social occupational activities are given up. People aren't doing the things they, know they would normally do because now they are using substances. The substances continue despite knowing that it has, uh, that it is a problem. Um, tolerance is an interesting one. Tolerance means either an increased need for the substance or a diminished effect. Now, does anybody use our most common and beloved substance, caffeine? Well, perhaps you remember the first time you had a Coke or a coffee and how you were bouncing off the walls and full of energy for an hour or more. Well, now it might seem that you need a couple of cups of coffee just to get to feeling okay. That is tolerance. It is a symptom of addiction, but as you can see, addi addiction is not necessarily always a horrible thing that destroys your life. A large percentage of humanity is addicted to caffeine in to some extent or another. And withdrawal. You, each substance has a different withdrawal uh, pattern. So heroin's withdrawal pattern, if you've ever seen horrifying movies like Requiem for a Dream, which I recommend if you would like to not sleep again for several weeks, you find that uh, withdrawal from heroin can itself kill you. You shouldn't go cold turkey off certain substance because the withdrawal pattern, uh, the withdrawal symptoms themselves can kill you. Um, extreme alcoholism can be the same way. Marijuana, not so much, at least not to my knowledge. And if you take that substance or another substance to relieve or avoid withdrawal, that is another problem. That is an evidence of withdrawal. All right. And then you have some extra little doohickeys that you specify here, some gizmos and doodads. You specify whether it's in early remission uh, or if it's in sustained remission. Now notice that this whole thing assumes it's the, tr it's the Alcoholics Anonymous model that says once you're an addict, you are always an addict. There is no way to specify that a person is no longer addicted to a substance. If you have developed tolerance, withdrawal, etc. In other words, if you have problematic use, substance use dependence, substance dependence, then as far as the DSM is concerned, you have it for the rest of your life. Even if you go, let's say, 30 solid years never having any cravings and having moderate use, etc., which happens. There, there are patterns like this that happen with some people. So recognized substances, we have alcohol, such as this lovely alcohol. Here's, here's some alcohol. Here's some other alcohol. I tried to buy some more alcohol to show you, but apparently you can't buy it before 8 o'clock in the morning because maybe there are laws and the residents of this uptight little part of the world believe that you are going to be drinking before 8 a.m. Yeah, that would actually probably indicate having a problem in most cases. Um, cannabis. Now, I don't have any sub samples of cannabis to show you, unfortunately. Hallucinogens, opioids, sedatives. So I don't know if you're able to see these lovely pills. I brought these to show you. These are pills. Okay, because let's be honest. This is vitamin E. That is allergy medicine. There's a hair stuck to it. That's gross. This is sleepy allergy medicine. This is melatonin for sleep. You probably are not going to get addicted to these things. I believe this is a multivitamin. This little guy that looks like ground up mushrooms or weed is actually, what is this? This is echinacea. It was all the rage in the 90s. It was supposed to boost your immune system, and then some research seemed to find it didn't. I don't know what the deal is more multivitamins. I think one of these is my wife, some of these is mine. But anyway, imagine these are psychoactive substances, which they're not. Um, inhalants, like huffing gas and things like that. Opioids, which you probably have heard quite a bit about with the opioid crisis. Sedatives, hypnotics, anxiolytics, people abusing Xanax and Valium and things like this. Stimulants, this includes cocaine, it includes m meth, crystal meth, etc. It also includes Adderall, Ritalin, Concerta. They are in the same family of substances. If you're abusing those things, then uh, some of the stuff that you have to worry about, withdrawal symptoms and tolerance and clearance from the body and therapeutic window are sort of similar to what happens with, say, cocaine or meth. And then tobacco. Tobacco is widely abused as well. Now these, you can give somebody a whatever disorder, alcohol use disorder, cannabis use disorder, opioids, etc. So the term addiction doesn't get used as much as it used to. 
And in the DSM and in the medical community, we tend to go more for dependence or problem use or something like that. Addiction wasn't as, as precisely defined as it might have been, but you can see that uh, addiction in general, or whatever word we use to mean addiction, usually is defined as having tolerance or withdrawal, or both. So we talked a little bit about what those things are in the previous slides. Intoxication isn't a long-term pattern. It's just being drunk right now or just being high right now or messed up on something or other. It's when the substance becomes toxic in the body. <coughs> now, this can sometimes become a judgment call. I'm tempted to take a swig of the crock and rum, but I know I would just spit it all over the monitor. I have zero tolerance for alcohol because it tastes so horrible. Anyway, recreational drugs... Um, Intoxication usually means that you're having central nervous system or psychological effects. You're having pleasurable feelings, dizziness, disorientation. However, the concept of toxic, toxic is a vaguely defined concept, If, as you know if you um, paid attention to Gwyneth Paltrow, for instance. Toxicity, uh, medically there are some definitions of it, but in the, even in this area, toxicity is sometimes poorly defined. Sometimes it's defined in ways that don't hold up to scientific scrutiny, although there are better ways to define it. And so sometimes when people say you're intoxicated, it doesn't mean something is destroying your cells. So if you're having a vision uh, because you're on mushrooms or LSD and you feel love towards all humanity, uh, technically, yes, you're intoxicated, but does that mean that something terrible is happening to your body or mind? Well, the people who use substances, including one of my former students, who is now the head of the Western New York uh, Psychedelic Society, and he comes to campus sometimes and gives lectures, um, they would suggest, no, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, and many human cultures since forever have thought so. So the concept of intoxication, it's an area where what is happening doesn't always totally match what the word seems to mean. Now, the DSM-5 asks you to specify the severity of the disorder. If you give somebody a disorder, you need to indicate whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and those are indicated by the number of the criteria that you meet, which is, frankly, kind of a weird thing to do. So the criteria, I mean, it works though. It seemed, it's not what I would have thought, but I would have thought, look at one of the criteria and see how much you meet it, like I meet this one so hard. But no, mild, moderate, and severe have to do with the number of criteria on that list that you have met. Two to three is mild, four to five is moderate, and severe is six. And I think there can be some problems with that. There's ongoing discussion of that, of that concept, that, that this system could be modified. But so far, it seems to work fairly well. It can be in remission, but as I said, it can never be gone. Once you're addicted, according to the DSM-5, it doesn't use the term addiction, it says dependent, for instance, um, then you are always dependent. Once you have a disorder, you always have a disorder. And that's how the DSM works in almost all cases. I can't think of a, another case. You could maybe go to court and have somebody go destroy old records that said you had a disorder. But once you have a disorder, including this one, you have it forever. Now, the research doesn't necessarily back that up. There is a subset of people who have been studied, who have been known to take certain substances to the point like alcohol or other drugs to where they have addiction and then they uh, appear in some cases to re return to not having any pattern of addiction. They go back to where they can use casually and socially in ways that are very similar to before they had any dependency problems. I don't know how common that is. I don't think it's the most common way to resolve a, a dependency problem. So just saying once addicted, always addicted is probably a safe thing to say if you want to make sure that you don't fall off the wagon. But it doesn't totally match the science. So a substance use problem versus or just diagnosing someone with substance use versus diagnosing them as having a disorder, and you can do both of these with the DSM, there are two differences, recurrence and the effect on functioning. A substance use disorder is something that recurs over and over despite you trying not to, and it messes with your Leben and your Arbeiten. If it's not doing those things, then you probably don't have a disorder. Now, the problems, with other problems with the DSM-5, this is a grown-ups manual. It continues to be. They've tried, I think, very hard to recruit an awful lot more people who study children and adolescents, but a pl I almost think we need a new, another manual that's just driven only by people who study children and adolescents, because this is yet another area where we find problems. It's not sensitive to developmental dis uh, differences, and one problem 
is that we might overdiagnose adolescents. If you <coughs> look at a certain level of severity of substance use disorder in grown-ups, then statistically that predicts some very bad things, for instance. But if that but if you find that same level of severity measured by number of symptoms, severity of symptoms, etc., in an adolescent, very frequently it does not predict statistically the same bad things. So if you're looking at a grown-up and they're drinking before, you know, seven every morning, they're drinking all day long, they have stopped having any social interaction, they don't have any hobbies anymore, their hobby is getting alcohol, drinking alcohol, and having hangovers. Um, this person has a serious problem. But if you have an 18-year-old doing exactly those things, yeah, they have a problem now, but it does not necessarily mean that they always will. There's a very good chance that if they can just be made to slow down or stop, that they'll be just fine in a few years. But the grown-up, statistically speaking, that grown-up has a problem that might take quite a long time to resolve and might be extremely difficult to resolve. So anyway, the DSM-5 DSM doesn't seem to have... Uh, incorporated all of this information into its matrix of problems here. So here is, oh, unfortunately, we're not seeing all of this. I think blue is adolescence and red is, <laughs> oh wait, is blue adolescence and red is adults? Let me just check quickly here. I have got the wrong aspect ratio apparently on my slides and that's unfortunate. Yeah, blue is adolescence. That's what I thought. Okay. So the blue bars represent adolescence. So this is the percentage of people in each group endorsing a particular symptom. Adolescents, a lot of them, like twice as many of them endorse tolerance. So this is groups of people who have um, substance use problems who've been referred. A lot of the adolescents, more of the adolescents report tolerance, time spent obtaining and using the substance or withdrawing, hazardous use, so use in ways that is dangerous, etc. Uh, attempts to give up the uh, or sorry, they've given up other activities because now they use alcohol or drugs or whatever, role obligation, etc. Um, but then when you get down to can't cut down or other problems, then the, the trends kind of reverse. And what you find is that despite adolescents having, who have substance abuse problems, reporting a lot of these symptoms very seriously, like tolerance, time spent using, and, and hazardous use, if you follow them over time, they are less likely to have problems later on than the grown-ups who had lower levels of those things when they were measured at problem time. So these things don't necessarily predict the same necessar the same se severity of problems later on for adolescents. Um, there are all sorts of things like this, like this, this, um, <laughs> uh, like, like this craft thing. There are all sorts of acronyms. I used to know a bunch of them. I don't know anymore. And they try to encode specific serious signs. They're supposed to be like a screen. They're not a DSM diagnosis. They're supposed to be quick screens to tell you whether a person might have serious problems and could benefit from having some treatment. So these kinds of things are in, you'll learn them if you ever do substance use treatment with your job, but they're not necessarily critical things to do all the time. Um, they, they don't necessarily match up to DSM criteria, although they tend to be things that are in the criteria somewhere or another. Like DSM doesn't say anything about using alcohol while you're alone, but that's a pretty, a pretty telling symptom. If somebody uses that, like drinks alone a lot, that person wants to drink more than a person who doesn't drink alone, for instance. So with alcohol, you have all of these symptoms here, um, and you have a bunch of interesting things that indicate with uh, intoxication. So this is just stuff that happens when you're on alcohol. And then you have things that that happen when you're in withdrawal. Autonomic hyperactivity, so your nervous system responding quickly and, 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 and intensely to stimuli from the outside. Hand tremor, insomnia, nausea, etc., etc. Okay, cannabis has a different set of things. Intoxication is different because the drug does different things to you. And it's not classified as a CNS depressant as alcohol is. It's classified usually as a hallucinogen and uh, because it gives you hallucinatory type experiences very frequently. So that's the category it gets put in, like with mushrooms and LSD and things like that. Although it's not the same as them. And withdrawal uh, gives you some of these kinds of things. However, withdrawal symptoms for cannabis tend to be milder than for alcohol and tend to take a lot longer to set in. Although I have known some people who have pretty intense cannabis withdrawal symptoms. 
the withdrawal symptoms are not life-threatening and they tend not to mess with your life as much they tend to not destroy your ability to uh, have relationships that are satisfying or to do your job necessarily so cannabis in some ways has a much more mild profile of intoxication and withdrawal eventually this will happen so let's talk briefly about some brain chemicals and the kind of stuff that is happening and I'm gonna use some of these uh, abbreviations so GABA gamma amino butyrate I can't remember the, uh, the whole name gamma gamma amino butyrate acetate okay whatever it is anyway it's a pretty awesome little chemical it's involved in a ton of stuff in your central nervous system your body but also your brain um, it's a neurotransmitter that means it is transmitted between the synapses so you know you've got some neuron here and it's got this little nucleus and then it has one axon it's got tons of little dendrites and information is coming in and then it has some little kind of arrangement of programming where if you get enough plus some minus charges going off then eventually it fires and it shoots this message down its axon and then at the end of the axon it meets dendrites for another neuron um, and at the end of the axon there are these little vesicles these little sacks of cells that like made with cell tissue that hold neurotransmitters and different axons for different neurons have different neurotransmitters so neurotransmitters the way they work is when the axon fires when this signal goes or the, the when a neuron fires when the signal goes down the axon the chemical electrical signal that is um, what the way these things work then it tr then it reaches the end oops I did a tap instead of a draw and it releases these little molecules and they go into this other into the dendrite of a neuron kind of like this one and then they increase or decrease um, they change the charge of this and it, there's little chemical reactions happening that change the chemical electrical charge here and then they make if there's enough of them the right way they make this dendrite send a signal to its neuron um, nucleus there. So anyway, that's neurotransmitters. Now, GABA is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain. That doesn't mean it just stops everything because the brain is networked in a bunch of very complicated ways. So, for instance, uh, chickens running around with their heads cut off, right? The reason they do this is because they have relays down in... So, here's your, here's your chicken... Oh, I'm drawing a chicken. Don't do that to me. And it's... It's got its little clawed, terrifying feet there. It's a rooster. It's got its little crest there and its little gobbly thing there. Okay, so if you... So what's happening here is the chicken's brain and the spinal cord here. Down here around the spinal cord, there's a... That's my understanding. There's a ganglion of nerves that is constantly saying run it's not kind of like that it's sending messages to the legs to make the legs do running motions and the brain is most of the time saying no don't run right now well if you sever that signal then all that's left is a signal going to the chicken's legs saying run so inhibition can work opposite is the point of this example so a chicken for instance starts running when the, when the inhibition fails, the brain is inhibiting the running most of the time. When a chicken is standing still, it's because there's a signal being sent to its legs telling it not to run. Otherwise, it would be running. So just because GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, don't go thinking that more GABA always means that people do less stuff. Like more GABA would, would cure ADHD or something like this because it doesn't necessarily work that way because the brain is networked in a, bu a bunch of extremely complicated ways. Now, there is this entire cholinergic system. It's a network of hundreds or thousands of different pathways in the brain with billions and billions of neurons and neuron clusters. And um, cholinergic uh, receptors and neurotransmitters are involved in the synapses. Uh, and that's what makes this the cholinergic system, is that those kinds of drugs are involved there. Well, the, the neurohormones choline and acetylcholine, which behave in very similar ways, those are neurohormones. They are circulated by your lymph system. They move much more slowly than neurotransmitters. They float around in your brain in different ways. Those things are 
mediated by the cholinergic system. If you've ever had a cold and had the runny, stuffy nose and the watering eyes and stuff, I mean, a lot of that is cholinergic symptoms. So this has to do with the parasympathetic nervous system. If you remember, the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight thing. And we have a whole separate set of reactions in our brain and body to shut that down and calm it down when we need to. And that's it's parasympathetic system. So the cholinergic system is responsible for parasympathetic effects in, involving di uh, salivation, digestion, muscle relaxation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't need to know all of this stuff, but you should know that GABA is a big deal, uh, and you should kind of sort of know that that the cholinergic system exists. I suppose. No, no, no. I'm trying to I'm trying to move forward now. Okay. So alcohol as many of you will know, but I needed to learn these things because this hasn't been my background. Uh, because alcohol, I try to drink a beer sometimes, it's so gross, I can't make it through. So anyway, um, behavioral and psychological effects will vary a lot. They'll vary by the person's age, by the person's sex, by genetic variables, and by tolerance sim uh, symptoms. If a person can hold their alcohol, it means they have mild addiction symptoms. It means that they, or maybe major ones, it means that they have developed tolerance for alcohol, that their brain has figured out how not to uh, let the alcohol affect it quite so much all the time. Um, the concentration of the ethanol, which is the alcohol active thing, thing, uh, chemical in your blood, it all, and that depends on your body weight, your age, your time since drinking, and your speed of drinking, how much food you had in your stomach, how much water, etc. Caffeine and carbonation can affect things. They can facilitate uh, alcoholic effects, as many of you might know. Altitude does it. Apparently at high altitude you get drunk faster. Hydration, if you had re recent meals, you, you know a lot of these things. So just saying, I had three drinks, therefore I should feel so-and-so, isn't necessarily going to work out for everybody all the time. There's a lot to take into account. <coughs> so research on this gets complicated. So alcohol is a general CNS, central nervous system, depressant. So GABA is an inhibitor it most it mostly in it's mostly involved in relays in nerve relays that inhibit other relays from doing things alcohol is generally as a chemical when it gets in your bra brain a depressant it generally slows down neurological activity however that doesn't mean you feel slowed down because maybe it slows down some inhibition so now you feel disinhibited which is a lot of what it does in the early stages. So it has neurochemical effects on all sorts of things, on GABA, on norepinephrine, which is otherwise known as adrenaline. So adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine. There's really only two things, adrenaline and noradrenaline. They were trademarked by some guy who studied them back in the 50s or whatever, and so he started suing people who used the term in textbooks. So people started to go with epinephrine, which is the same thing. But um, adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, noradrenaline, norepinephrine, they're just slight variants of the same thing, and they do very similar things in your uh, nervous system, have similar effects. Serotonin, which we're going to call 5-HT, which is its, semoral, its standard name. NE, which is what we're going to call norepinephrine. Glutamate, which is basically kind of a, an off-product of sugar, as I understand it, especially with NMDA receptors, which we might talk briefly about. And it's not MDMA, which is ecstasy. This is different, NMDA. The different chemical receptors in your brain <coughs> are classified according to what kinds of chemicals will open them up. Will open them up. Um, dopamine is affected by alcohol. The, the entire cholinergic system is affected by alcohol. The opioid system, which is what's making you feel completely buzzed out and euphoric if you're taking heroin or if you're being given uh, the drugs that your dentist gives you, for instance. Um, it's affected by those kinds of things. So alcohol has so many effects all over your brain. It's a very small, simple molecule that crosses the blood-brain barrier. Now, th what the blood-brain barrier is, I mean, you've got your brain here. That's a brain. And then the rest of your body, like here in your stomach, you know, you've got sloshing stuff. And stuff goes from your stomach into your liver. And your liver filters some stuff out. Anything that makes it through there goes into your circulation system. You know, there's your heart in here somewhere and your lungs and stuff. Um, it gets into your blood. Now, the blood-brain barrier, there are billions of connections inside your brain to your vascular system, to your blood vessels. And so your blood is constantly pumping through your brain, but it's like a highway where only certain kinds of cars can exit. And the things you need to exit is your, the, your molecule, you, the molecule, need to have just a certain level of fattiness. You need to be a, lip, a certain level of lipid 
fattiness because that uh, means that you have the right combination of electric charge so that you can make it through the little holes in the capillaries and go into the brain. Alcohol definitely does that. Stuff that doesn't cross the blood, blood brain barrier, it just stays on the highway and keeps going. It goes around and around and it never affects your thinking or your feeling, things like that. So anyway, low doses of alcohol cause generalized physiological arousal. You feel active, excited, because it's a depressant and it's probably, and it's reducing inhibitions. It's reducing executive functions. And so a lot of those executive functions are inhibiting behavior. It can make you have more behavioral activation, which we know is an executive function because it's inhibiting behavioral inhibition. Um, this is me mediated largely by increases in norepinephrine. You can get a pleasant buzz. You can get relaxation, which also seems to have to do with inhibition of brain pathways that are constantly helping you monitor and think about things. Well, that's part of what's going on with anxiety. You're constantly thinking of how you look, what's going to happen, what are the consequences of this action, what am I going to do next, am I late for class? Well, it inhibits a lot of that stuff, and so you feel pretty good not thinking about all that stuff that you've got to worry about. So alcohol tends to pr promote those effects in low doses. Moderate doses, um, you can hit stimulation or inhibition of inhibition, as I mentioned before, of brain areas that are involved in planning. So you might notice that people who are drunk don't plan ahead very much. Uh, movement, so you can get your inhibition of movement gets reduced. And a lot of this is going on in your cerebellum, way in the back towards your brainstem, a bit above your brainstem. Um, you get increased animation of gestures and speech, so you've got your friend, and I am telling you, Jonathan, that what I experienced last Thursday, you, know, you get that kind of thing, inhibition of those uh, gestures and speech is what we do on a daily basis. We inhibit our speech and our gestures for social appropriateness because we decided that it's not okay if people make big gestures all the time. Well, that gets inhibited when you're drunk and you can become a bit expansive, as we might say. You can get slurred speech and sluggish and slow reaction time. <coughs> you can also continue to feel pretty good. At high doses, you can get acute intoxication means you could die. This is very bad. You could be dead. Alcohol can kill you, of course. You can get alcohol poisoning, as they call it. Toxicity. Your NMDA receptors, which are largely activated by alcohol, might stop responding, which seems to be uh, maybe a function that's built in to try and protect you, but it also causes all sorts of problems. Ataxia, where you can't control your motions very much. You have almost no ability to learn or remember things. And when that drops down to a certain level, then you you're processing information while you're being psycho insane drunk but then later you don't remember it because it didn't get put into long-term memory and so that's called being blackout drunk drunk in ways that you won't remember later later it has some anesthetic effects so you can be so drunk that you don't feel pain or you feel it much less in certain ways so you're there are um a lot of anesthetic drugs that get used in hospitals and surgery and stuff like that that antagonize NMDA receptors. So in other words, they block the NMDA receptor so that other chemicals can't trigger them and open them up and let chemical flow happen. So NMDA receptors have a lot to do with this anesthetic effect. You can have hallucinations when you're drunk. You can have dissociation where you don't feel like yourself or you're not aware of your identity or you think you have a different identity. And you can have brain tissue damage, literal brain cell destruction. So this is... Extremely high doses of alcohol are very, very bad for you. Now, let's talk briefly about how receptors work. Now, this is the wall of a cell. So I'm going to draw. This is in, or sorry, let me do that. Inside. And this is outside. I don't want you to memorize all these different receptor sites. I just showed you so that you would see um, what's going on here. Now, a neurotransmitter like a benzodiazepine might, it's, you know, this weird little molecule. I don't know what they look like. They got all these bonds and they're all globbed together. It might come and stick there. Or a GABA molecule. It's probably got a hexagon in there, right? I don't know. I don't know squat about this kind of chemistry. A GABA molecule might come and it bonds there. And these stick together. 
in this receptor, there's going to be a little shape of something, a little shaped cavity type thing that this molecule fits in. And that's important because then these little magnetic and electrical forces on the surface of these atoms, they change the magnetical and electrical properties, oops, on this receptor. And that leads to, if you get enough of these um, receptor sites activated or in certain patterns, then that leads to this hole in the middle. There's a, there's a channel that goes down through here and it makes a tunnel into the middle of your cells. And so certain chemicals can get in there. Now it's mostly closed, but if one of these molecules, like it's a key, I've got the lock and you've got the key. No, Madonna, that wasn't sexual. We're so glad that you explained that to us. Okay, you've got, so these molecules are kind of like a key and the receptor sites are like a lock. And if the molecule opens that lock, then the door is open. And then this is negative chlorine, negatively charged um, ions. These are chlorine item ions. Other ions that are very important include negatively charged sodium ions. That's why you need some salt every once in a while. You don't get any salt. Your brain's going to st shut down and your nervous system's going to shut down and you're going to die. But you probably only need like a tiny bit every day. But anyway, these things will go in here and then they end up on the inside of the cell and then they do all sorts of things depending on what the cell is now if this is an if this cell is a neuron then these things going in change oh I just got dripped on by my environment that's all right my hair is amazing who can even drips don't hurt it so it changes the electrical charge inside the, the this environment and if the charge gets more and more and more negative then eventually this neuron, it, it, well, this is going to be on the dendrite of a neuron. There's going to be, um, it's going to add to the evidence that maybe this neuron should fire and do something. So anyway, that was a long explanation. So long -term re a long-term use of alcohol in, with dopamine receptors. Oh, sorry, alcohol, meth, all these kinds of things. Dopamine, it's not just a feel-good chemical, but that's one of the things it kind of does. It helps with motivation and feeling good and... It has something to, uh, a lot to do with depression and animation and, f and hopefulness and things like this. Well, you don't want your dopamine system to stop working. It's not good for you. So you don't like this here. These are some, uh, what are these, PET scans? Anyway, this is showing activity in, in these key areas in your, um, in your brain, in in some centers in your brain. I don't actually remember. I think this is going to be your amygdala, perhaps. No, it's a little too far forward. Anyway, this is an area where dopamine receptors are kind of important. You can see that dopamine activation gets reduced by use of stimulants and some other kinds of drugs. Most drugs have some effect on dopamine, and long-term drug effects reduce the ability of your dopamine system to provide the dopamine to all your cells, your neurons that it needs so that your, dro your dopamine activities continue to do what they're supposed to do for you. In layman's terms, if you're addicted to certain kinds of substances for long periods of time, you can end up permanently depressed because your brain just can't produce dopamine at the levels that it needs to any longer. And I'm really being dripped on by my unfortunate roof. Oh well, we'll keep going here. Uh, let's talk about a little bit about marijuana. Um, it has dozens of psychoactive compounds in it. The most powerful one is called THC, delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol. -can anyway, THC, and THC is the one that we've studied the most. It binds to receptors in lots of places in your brain. Now, external drugs bind to receptors that are made for internal drugs. We don't have receptors that are made for marijuana, that are made for ecstasy, that are made for heroin. We have receptors that are made for neurotransmitters that our body produces. So drugs work, that, you know, happy, feel good, psychoactive, make you have a trip, whatever drugs, including alcohol, caffeine. They work by pretending to be these internal drugs, these internal um, chemicals, neurotransmitters and neurohormones. So THC binds to receptors of various other kinds of um, neurotransmitters and hormones in places in your brain, like the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia have to do with, uh, as I'm trying to remember, memory, um, movement. The basal ganglia is where it gets damaged heavily with Parkinson's disorder, Parkinson's syndrome. 
Um, the hippocampus, lots of memory effects there, lots of smell and emotion effects going on. Your cerebellum, which has a lot to do with movement, but it has a lot to do with a lot of things. We don't understand the cerebellum very well at all. It, we know lots about it, but it's just an incredibly complicated thing, apparently. And in the cortex, the outside, where a lot of our thinky things happen in, in, in lots of places. It changes the way you think, it changes the way you feel, the way you move, etc. It affects a lot of neurochemicals, norepinephrine, glutamate, GABA, dopamine, serotonin, as well as many others. So marijuana has across-the-board effects, and those effects can be different for lots of other people. Oh yeah, all those things are called cannabinoids. Anyway, um, its initial general effects include euphoria, disinhibition. This is why the idea of just the stoner who's too chilled out to hurt anybody isn't totally true. People using marijuana assault other people at much higher rates than people who aren't using any drugs at all. But it's, my understanding is it's not as, uh, as high as people using alcohol. But it's a disinhibiting, it's a disinhibiting drug. It reduces your inhibition executive functions. And so you do things you wouldn't normally do. You're not as violent as with some other drugs, but you're, you tend to be more annoying and violent. Now, violent isn't always like killing somebody. It could just be screaming at them and saying, shut up, or something, saying a mean thing. But this happens more often when you're on marijuana than when you're not, in general. Individual experiences may differ, but it's disinhibi disinhibition. You might experience increased energy, sociability. If you continue to use it for up to about a half an hour, you tend to get lowered anxiety, relaxation, although remember you could also get a bad strain and get lots of paranoia, which is the opposite of lowered anxiety. And you can get a sense of contentment and well-being, which is one of the reasons why people like marijuana. If you're chronically using it, like all the time, for a long period of time, unfortunately some people get what's called demotivational syndrome, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it's a, a chronic inability to motivate yourself to do things in ways that you used to be able to motivate yourself to do things. So you just don't want to do things anymore. Then people who are quote-unquote potheads, people who have used marijuana for long periods of time, they will sometimes get demotivational syndrome and have a very hard time with their relationships and their jobs because of it. So that's a problem. If you stop using marijuana, a lot of people experience not very much uh, withdrawal at all, but many people who have used it chronically for a long period of time will get craving, sleep disturbance, appetite disturbance, irritability, and anxiety. So it's not a totally friendly drug that has no negative consequences, and chronic use especially can bring on some of those consequences. I should still say it's not nearly as dangerous and overall doesn't seem to have nearly the negative effects of something like alcohol. Um, but it's, it's there. I mean, it's a drug. It can cause some bad things. Now, looking at just the frequency of people using certain drugs, you'll find that, so this is 8th grade to 10th grade, 12th grade, the percentage of people saying they've used certain things in the past year. Okay, 8th graders? Holy crap. Why, why are all these 8th graders saying they used alcohol and like 12% of them said they're using marijuana or other drugs? What? Although I was in 8th grade and a lot of people drank, so that's reasonable, a third of them. Um, when you get up to, and this is any use in the past year, like did you just have a sip or something? When you get up to senior year, two-thirds of people more or less, according to this study, anyway, you should think a majority of people have tried alcohol, maybe a little less have tried marijuana in the past year. doesn't mean ever in their life, just in the past year and a smaller number of tried illicit drugs. So these patterns are what we would expect. Um, the number of people who are using these things daily is much different. Now look at these percentages. This, this is 5%. That's the top of this chart here, right? So about 5% of high school seniors in this study, and I think this was a large population scale probability sample, so this is fairly generalizable. Only about 1 in 20 high school seniors is using marijuana on a daily basis. It's not that common. Alcohol is slightly less likely to be used on a daily basis, possibly because alcohol, if you're using it every day, it really messes with your ability to function. Marijuana, if you use it every day, it's probably easier to show up and make it through your classes and things like that than it is with alcohol. So binge drinking among adolescents is something we're very concerned about. It can lead to alcohol toxicity. It can it doesn't predict alcoholism in adulthood as much as people sometimes think it does, but it is a risk factor, a bad one. And you can do really dangerous things. <coughs> you can see it becomes more common um, as children get older, and people see it as less of a problem as children get older. Now, boys tend to use 
alcohol and other substances at slightly earlier ages than girls. I've read recently that due that probably due to social changes in how we socialize boys and girls, that girls are now um, that gap is closing. The girl thing is rising a little bit, and the boy thing is dropping. Your generation uses alcohol and drugs at lower rates than mine did. Does whatever did at your age. So those things are apparently approaching each other a little bit there. So that's kind of positive and negative. Anyway, there are some ethnic differences in alcohol uh, use in um, adolescence, and there are cultural differences in how alcohol and drugs are viewed in different places. Now, in Hispanic Americans are much more likely to have used alcohol by the time they reach 12th, 12th grade, but they're not necessarily... Um, I'm sorry, but uh, white individuals, it's pretty similar. They might have used it a little bit more in 10th grade. They calmed down a bit. African-American individuals, there's kind of like just an increasing pattern. Um, these are healthcare disparities that a lot of people study. Keep in mind that there are cultural differences in how drug use is viewed. I really hope the audio on this is usable at all because that rain is pretty loud. Hoping my microphone isn't just picking it all up. Probably. I might have to do this again. Probably not, because I'm not dressing up like this again. It was fun, but it took a while. So, the number of people who are meeting DSM-5 criteria, about 1 to 9%. So you can think, like, pick the middle, maybe, because that's multiple studies. Well, this is loud. About 1 to 9% of adolescents will meet criteria for substance use disorders. Uh, from mild criteria and moderate to severe two to three percent maybe some studies find five percent but I'm seeing that range I'm just gonna guess in the middle I don't know two to three the prevalence is higher for older adolescents good we should know that I mean it's good that young kids aren't drugging themselves up as much as older kids boys this is not surprising boys have always been uh, either encouraged or tolerated in using alcohol more than girls and white individuals are more likely to have to meet criteria for substance use disorders than non-white individuals and this violates a lot of people's stereotypes however the data seem to be pretty clear right now now i'm going to stop this lecture right now and in the second period we're the second lecture we're going to talk about models of alcohol use that are useful in understanding why and when people use alcohol let me switch back here to my video capture, here to my webcam, and you probably can't see all the rain occasionally dripping on me, but this rainstorm is getting crazy here.